Africa. It's where I was born and raised and where you missed the rain from. Ever since the age of colonialism ended, Africa has been working hard to modernize its economies and catch up with the rest of the world. But to do that, it needs lots and lots of new infrastructure, roads, Railways, ports, dams, cheesecake factories, you name it, Africa needs to build it. The only problem is that stuff all costs a shitload of money, money that most African countries don't have. But in recent years, many African countries have found themselves a new sugar daddy. China. Over the last several decades, China has been... All right, I want to stop it there because... This is comedy. I get it. But even just the way he said China, you know, to, to mimic Donald Trump, you know, it's interesting because in the beginning he says since the end of the colonial era, I saw someone in the chat say end of the colonial era. When did that end? Right. Because if you've ever read Kwame Nkrumah, the first president of Ghana, who was literally assassinated by the Central Intelligence Agency, I believe that was what, 1968? I believe, um, 1960, I always get it mixed up. It's either 1966 or 1968. Um, anyway, if you read any of his work, you would know that, uh, neocolonialism is what really does dominate at the, the situation in Africa. Um, actually it was 1972, huh? But he was, he was actually deposed, I believe, Kwame Nkrumah. Um, in the 60s, I know he had to go into exile. Um, yes, in 66. So he was deposed by a CIA back group. Anyway, neither here nor there. The point is, is of course, yeah, I saw that <laughs> the chat is hilarious. Yeah, this is comedy. It was, It's not funny at all. But I get it. He's trying to do like comedic shtick as he's promoting pro-war, anti-China talking points about China and Africa. But to even just say that the colonial period has ended to me is just so egregious because, first of all, I think France has relationships with 14 former colonies where it literally controls the currencies. And as I said in the Twitter post, my comment on this, you'll, you won't hear Trevor Noah say that the West, Western corporations alone by themselves, Western corporations by themselves, literally extract, literally put africa in a deficit of more than 40 billion dollars per year that's not the total that comes out of africa that's the deficit between what goes in what corp what multinational corporations bring in and then what comes out the plus minus and africa is in the minus in totality by more than 40 billion dollars per year because of western corporations that's not chinese corporations and you'll even see here that they kind of admit that but let, let me continue all right pumping resources into Africa. The country has invested hundreds of billions of dollars across the continent, ranging in everything from transportation and infrastructure to real estate and technology. Large African infrastructure projects would be viewed as risky by any traditional bank and would therefore struggle to get financed, but China's Export-Import Bank doesn't care. This All right, I have to just comment on that. Because you saw the photo, right? They showed a photo of African workers, right? Hard hats and whatnot. And they're trying to paint this ominous picture, ominous picture in the corporate media of China, Africa investment. But yet they're describing something that the West in imperialism as a whole has never done, which is invest in infrastructure. And now it's saying that the Export-Import Bank, the Exim Bank, which is a state-owned bank, which is a Chinese state-owned bank, it's not a private bank, that that bank doesn't care about how these projects are not profitable. A traditional bank wouldn't do this. What does that tell you? That already tells you that the, con the situation is actually more complex. You're not going to have Goldman Sachs, Barclays Bank, you're not even going to have the World Bank, right, invest in infrastructure at this capacity without conditionalities, without investing in projects that we'll see profits for both sides but china's exim import bank doesn't care exim bank the export import bank doesn't care it's such a problem it's just it's just so laughable but anyway let's continue
This bank will give low interest or no interest loans to African countries so they can build these trains or dams or other projects. China touts the fact that their foreign investment and aid is no strings attached, with no requirements on factors like respect of human rights or democratic elections. We do not interfere in the internal affairs of African countries, impose our will on African countries, or attach any political conditions on economic aid. That's right, baby. China has been making it rain in Africa. It's the most money anyone has sent to Africa without being guilt-tripped by a celebrity sing-along. And no strings attached, by the way. China doesn't care about your government or human rights or anything. They're basically the cool mom of international finance. Oh, you and your friends, you want to come party this weekend? Well, come do it in our basement with your child soldiers. We didn't hear a thing. So we meant. All right, I got to react to that. I mean, this is just, this just shows how deeply humanitarian interventionism is embedded in the corporate media. I mean, first of all, I believe it's Time Warner who Trevor Noah's bosses, right? Comedy Central, I believe is owned by Time Warner. Please correct me if I'm wrong. But anyway, the point is, is that humanitarian interventionism is just bleeding out of Trevor Noah right now. The fact that Trevor Noah has a problem with China trading with African countries without conditionalities and without political interference, to me, just shows how committed to war the corporate media is how committed people like trevor noah is people like him are to war right i mean think about this it is laudable that china does not try to interfere in the affairs of african countries and yes just like most countries with systems that hey are, don't happen to be socialists happen to be capitalists happen to have so many contradictions some things that honestly are the problem are, 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 first of all, rooted in the West's interference politically in places, let's say, like the Democratic Republic of Congo. There are things that happen in these countries that, yeah, we would say, okay, we oppose that. But if China was to interfere in that, what, what do you think would happen, right? Like, what kind of world do we live in where we encourage countries to interfere in the affairs of others in order to try to help them. That's the very white saviorist, imperialist saviorism, the kind of white man's burden imperialism that has literally placed African countries one after another after another in this political instability and chaos. So China doesn't do it. Wh who benefits from China's political interference? What what would it what would First of all, what would China get out of politically interfering in the Democratic Republic of Congo or Zimbabwe or anywhere else when there literally is no victory there? There's nothing that China will get out of that. And, and vice versa, the only thing that happens with interference is more chaos. We see that all across the world with the United States, with the West. Whenever they interfere in a country, uh, hello, Ethiopia right now, hello, Zimbabwe with the sanctions and the millions upon millions poured into opposition media. We can go across board Libya, 2011, Guinea, uh, just recently with the coup, the U.S. helped train the general who led that coup, right? We're talking about over and over and over again on the African continent, AFRICOM, the U.S. African Command, having relationships with all but one African country, Eritrea. And what's happened since then? What's happened since Obama's African bonanza around the continent. Chaos. Trevor Noah likes it though. Trevor Noah says, oh, China should, should care. They should care about the child soldiers. Hello? The United States and the West have literally created a situation of a human rights catastrophe all over Africa, not least because the African continent, all of the countries on the African continent for that matter, don't have sovereignty for the most part. They're literally being starved by a Western-dominated, U.S.-led, imperialist global system. That's the reality. That's not China. That is not China. But yet we hear over and over again that it is. But anyway, let's continue. Anyways, this is a great arrangement for Africa. But maybe it won't come as a surprise that China isn't just giving billions of risky loans to Africa 
out of the goodness of its heart. Many scholars suggest Beijing's true end game in Africa is not solely financial, but rather political. There is empirical evidence that China has been using these infrastructure investments to affect worldwide politics. It's been found that if an African country recognizes Taiwan as a country, they receive, on average, 2.7 fewer Chinese infrastructure projects within their borders each year. Conversely, if an African country votes overwhelmingly along with China in the United Nations General Assembly, they receive 1.8 more infrastructure projects each year. At one point or another, 30 African countries have had formal relations with Taiwan. Now Eswatini is the only African nation to recognize the island. Yep. All right, so here we go with the Taiwan question. I mean, this is how political this is. This is just politicized nonsense, propaganda. U.S. talking points, U.S. militarism talking points. Now we're getting into Taiwan. I mean, this is what they have to say. The China has a trade volume with Africa of $200 billion annually. The U.S. about 37, 30, I think it's like 37-ish. Who knows how that fluctuates over the course of a year, but on average, it's a little, it's, a, you know, it's so much less. All right. So think about that. They are talking about the corporate media is talking about Taiwan here, just like the summit for democracy where Taiwan was invited as a country. Now, even Trevor Noah is using the African con they're using Trevor Noah to peddle Taiwan propaganda in talking about Africa. This is how desperate the imperialists are because think about this. Taiwan has absolutely nothing to do with China Africa investment. Nothing. It did in the 70s, right? Yeah, before 1970 what was it? 1 before the UN recognized China, mainland China, the People's Republic of China as the rightful uh government of China. Before that, it was the Republic of China, which happened to be stationed in Taiwan. It was not Taiwan. People get that confused. It was not Taiwan. It, the U.S. still called it Formosa for a very long time, which is ridiculous. But nonetheless, here we are talking about Taiwan, right? This is how desperate they are to, to try to claim 2.7 infrastructure projects on average. Meanwhile, China has literally built tens of thousands of kilometer of rail kilometers of rail and road hundreds upon hundreds of schools and electric power grids and projects and we're talking about 2.7 projects on average fewer this is helping that they don't want to get into the magnitude and the scale of this and how china africa investment is a growing relationship and it has nothing to do with taiwan it has absolutely nothing to do with taiwan anyway let's continue That's the power of money right there. Enough of it can make you switch allegiances, change your principles, do anything. Hell, for enough money, you could probably get Africans to start saying that Africa is just one country. Yes, yes, we are just one big country full of giraffes, huh? Where's, where's the money, huh? Still, China has been really successful with this. Out of all of Africa, every country has broken off relations with Taiwan, except Eswatini, which means Eswatini either really has like principles that they stick to. I'm gonna fast or they forward just this. Haven't heard about the deal yet. Good for you, Eswatini, refusing that money from. Hello, Ta hello, Taiwan. Well, well, tough luck for Taiwan, but subordinating your foreign policy. Taiwan, but Taiwan, but subordinate. I was fast forwarding it because this isn't that important. I want to get into the pieces where he starts talking about some of the intricacies here. Because he's just going off on the tangent. It doesn't really matter. I want to let's let's talk about the intricacies. All right, hold on. Let, let's continue. Coordinating your foreign policy to another country is probably worth it if it means getting all this investment. I mean, think of all the jobs that these projects create in Africa. And it is true, these projects do create jobs. It's just that many of those jobs are going to China. In Africa, China's estimated to have won almost half of all engineering procurement and construction contracts. But those contracts haven't come without controversy. 
the country has been accused of unfair labour practices in Africa, including bringing in its own workers instead of hiring locally. The steady influx of Chinese companies and workers have fueled accusations the wealth and opportunities are not being shared with the local community. We all do the railway work, but the Chinese constantly say we're the boss. We're the ones who run the show. This is Ethiopia's main Chinese economic zone. This small business makes jeans. Everything is imported from China. Sewing machines, methods, and supervisors. The average salary of an Ethiopian worker is $56 a month, 10 times less than the average Chinese worker. That's right. When China invests in these projects, they often send over Chinese workers to Africa to fill all the best positions, which isn't right. I mean, the best jobs shouldn't be given to a person because of where they're from. The best job should be given to whoever has the best answers in a job interview. So what's your big... All right, this is just slanderous. This is just absolutely, uh, uh, Nevaeh said, absolutely naked propaganda. It's exactly what this is. Because, all right, let's 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 just be very clear here. The China-Africa relationship, there it's very complex. China is, is much more developed, has so much more of a strong economic base, development, technology, technological know-how, that of course the supervisory situation is going to be one where there is well, Chinese technicians coming and trying to help the those who who don't have the experience, don't have the the, the infrastructure, the technological know how. He doesn't say that China, by far, in terms of cultural exchange, you have literally tens of thousands of Africans studying in China to build these skills, to be able to go back to their countries and be able to take over in these supervisory positions. You don't hear that. But furthermore, I want to share with you an article that's very important and from someone who I love, Deborah Brottengam, who works at John, John Hopkins, uh, one of the best academics you can find on this, maybe the only academic you can find on this question that is any legitimacy, in my opinion. So I'm going to stop sharing this because I want to just show you this article. And you know what? We don't even have to go further in because I think we need to debunk some of these myths now. I don't think... Uh, there is, um, <clears throat> I don't think there's enough time in the world for me. First of all, I have to get to Luna's stream, which she said starts in 10 minutes. So it's really important that we go into debunking some of this. So let me share the Deborah Brottengam article because it is an important one. I'm not going to read it all the way through, but I want to get to this point about employment. All right. Um, so she goes over five myths and I'm going to put it in the chat actually. Uh, after I share it. So here it is. But I'm going to put this in the chat for all of you so you all can read it another time. All right. So you can read the whole thing. But so five minutes about Chinese investment in Africa. This is all the way back to 2015. This has been talked about for so long. She wrote a great book published in 2009 called The Dragon's Gift, which you all should get. Honestly, if you can, I read it, what, a couple years ago and it was so educational. And it talk, and she talks about she's studied there. She's been on contract with the IMF. She's studied these projects. And she demonstrates the complexities of African underdevelopment, of Chinese investment, and how it is just so far off to say that China's here just colonizing, trying to profit, trying to just extract. Actually, a lot of these projects end up not being so profitable because there is an economic imbalance. But there is a principle here of South-South development which she doesn't necessarily say, but it's pretty obvious that China's principle of South-South development is very important in terms of bringing everybody up because that will help China in the long term and that will help everybody in the global South in the long term. And so that's why there's so much investment going on. And it really does help China where there is this overstretch of its own economy to be able to develop this Belt and Road Initiative so that there is more balance, right, across uh, the global economic situation. But let's go to um, the job situation. Let me look. Um, here we go. 
A third persistent myth is that Chinese companies employ their own nationals. Last July, when President Barack Obama told a group of African ambassadors in Ethiopia that economic relationships cannot simply uh, be about building countries' infrastructure with foreign labor, everyone knew he was pointing the finger at China. But was this an accurate description of Chinese business practices? In a small group of oil-rich countries with expensive construction sectors, including Algeria, Equatorial Guinea, and Angola, governments do allow Chinese construction firms to import their own workers from China. But elsewhere in Africa, the research is clear. The vast majority of employees at Chinese firms are local hires. Hong Kong-based academics Barry Soutman and uh, Yan Hoi Rong surveyed 400 Chinese companies operating in over 40 countries. They found that while management and senior technical positions tended to remain Chinese, more than 80% of workers were local. Some companies had localized as much as 99% of their workforces. So she goes on to our own research in Ethiopia, found that nearly 4,800 Ethiopians were employed by a Chinese firm that built Ethiopia's urban light rail project. Another 4,000 Ethiopians worked at uh, Huajian, a Chinese food shoe factory close to the capital of Addis Ababa. In both cases, some local workers were even sent to China for management training. Oh, look at that. You don't hear our uh, our, our boy Trevor Noah uh, talk about how, you know, China trains, right? Does have a pretty robust cultural exchange, educational commitment to the African people as well in, in these countries. Like, you don't hear that. And I spoke with uh, Dana Showtime Burton, a hip-hop artist, advocate, activist, Black American, uh, Detroit native, who's lived in Shanghai for 19 years, who's been to Guangzhou many times, who has many relationships with Africans in China, Black Americans in China. And he said, you don't hear this, but there are tens of thousands of Africans being trained in these areas, technology, economic development, that just isn't available because of the domestic situation, because of the international situation for the African people. This isn't to say there aren't problems. And even at the FOCAC conference, China, China's representatives were very clear. Xi Jinping was very clear. There are problems with the relationship that always arise, of course, in any partnership, especially one that isn't always balanced. But those are problems for these countries to figure out, for China and the uh, countries in question to figure out. It's not for the U.S. and West to figure out, and it's certainly not for a two-bit comedian like Trevor Noah to figure out. So these practices make economic sense for Chinese companies. In order to bring workers from China, they would have to pay much higher salaries plus airfare, room, and board. There are certainly tensions around many Chinese work sites in Africa, but they tend to listen to disputes in, uh, about salaries and work conditions, not whether jobs exist for locals. So, you know, I'm not going to share more than that about this article. You should all read it for yourself. But that's just one, you know, she's done such extensive research, gone all across the continent to discuss this issue, to investigate, to research it. So definitely look up Deborah Bragam, look up that article. It's a very important one. She's written many on um, on this question, debt trap diplomacy, how that's a total myth. I'm not going to go over the rest of the Trevor Noah. I, I can't listen to it. Look. The pay for African workers is very low. The level of development in Africa is very low. Neocolonialism, Western exploitation, the broad situation is, is very low. And, and China, you know, has kind of dual concerns because China is still an underdeveloped country. So, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that China is a much better friend to the African people, to African continent, African nations than the West. Because... It provides this infrastructure, it provides this technological know-how, it offers the ability for African countries to develop so that things like wages can get higher. Like, people don't know that the Belt and Road Initiative has already lifted millions of people out of extreme poverty all across the world, and this includes the African continent. 70% of China's 4G technology is produced by Huawei, the Chinese uh, tech company that the U.S. sanctions. That people don't know that. So I'm going to share with you my article on, um, on this issue uh, that uh, I wrote for Substack. It was actually a, a amended speech that I gave at Geopolitical Economy Research Group. Um, I'm going to share this now on the screen, and I'll just give you some data points on the real relationship between China and Africa, all right? Because I think it's so important to, to understand how 
this question, how this issue is distorted. And it's distorted for nefarious means. Like, I can't say enough how the United States and the West are literally destabilizing the African continent right now, country by country. And they're doing it because they want, they do not want African countries to trade with China. They want these countries to remain impoverished. They want them to remain underdeveloped. They want them to remain super exploited, neo colonies. Even though the United States literally says it all the time, just read the way that US politicians, from Donald Trump to Joe Biden, even to AFRICOM's uh, g general, right, Stephen Townsend, you read these documents and you'll see that they don't care about the economic benefit that Africa could have for the United States. The United States understands now it has nothing to offer. All it wants to do is militarize the continent to keep it away from China. They're not going to offer no rail, no roads, nothing. So I'm just going to share this. So here's the article, how the West distorts the China-Africa relationship. I asked, you know, it's been characterized as nefarious uh, with China being labeled a new colonizer, but is this true? So, you know, I give some context about the political turmoil, how history is marching forward without the United States and how China, China the China-Africa relationship is a big part of this, big part of multipolarity in this push against U.S. hegemony. So, you know, I talk about the value in trade, as I said, $200 billion per year. And that there's been these stories, right? Uganda, Djibouti a couple of years ago, 2019, Uganda 2021, just this uh, within the last month, talking about how China is taking back assets, like, for example, this airport that's still under construction in Uganda for non payment. And we find out always that this is fake news. It's not even close to being true. And actually, the one time that a project didn't work out in Sri Lanka, right? Uh, this port that has always been talked about, it's not an African uh, situation. Um, but in Sri Lanka, this has always been talked about as being the one example where China took it back. But as Deborah Brotengam has wrote about this, right? Deborah Brotengam has wrote about this too. She says that actually it was not a situation of just taking the asset back due to non-payment. It was a, a situation where you know, the government of Sri Lanka just couldn't keep hold of the port. China uh, was really looking to salvage it, and it just didn't work out. It was not some sort of, we're going to take it back because you uh, have some punitive measure. It was just something that just did not work. But you should definitely look up Deborah Rottengum's work on that because she wrote about it, I believe, in even the Washington Post. But the most important thing here is that Flexibility and solidarity are real aspects, hallmarks of China's relationship with Africa. For example, in 2018, China allowed Ethiopia to defer interest payments on the construction of a railway connecting the country to Djibouti. And the term of that loan was extended by 15 years. And that debt relief agreements like this exist for 19 African countries. And during the pandemic, China has forgiven countless loans, countless loans to African countries. It's very important to, to, to realize this. And so I just said about Huawei and technology, 13,000 kilometers of roads and rail, uh, and there's projects underway now to help Africa use its resources to build a green sort of economy, a great green wall, as they call it on the African continent, renewable energy. And then of course, the pledge of 1 billion vaccine doses for COVID-19 in order to fight COVID-19. The African continent literally has single digit vaccination rates. And despite the fact that the African continent did pretty good with COVID-19 because the governments took it seriously, it's still a big problem. And uh, we have outbreaks and, and just too many deaths and it just affects already an increasingly fragile economic situation for African countries. So all we get is slander instead, right? That's all we get from the United States and the West is slander of this relationship. And so, you know, I write about this. I write about uh, the way that the U.S. and West continue to exploit. And I write about how China is offering something different. It's offering a model that stands actually in contrast to the Western neocolonial arrangement. 
It's not offering extraction, right? A lot of these projects actually don't work out and don't yield immediate profit. That's the thing. They talk about this with Chinese high-speed rail in China. They say, oh, this is just racking up all this debt. China is literally spending public dollars to improve infrastructure. It's not worrying about the debt. It's literally money being invested in something, right? Invested in something that people need. So the debt is not the issue here, especially when you have a nationalized banking sector like in China. The Chinese, as I said before, the Export-Import Bank, that's a state-owned bank. The People's Bank of China, the central bank, Unlike the United States, which is private public, the so-called Federal Reserve, it's basically a private corporation. China is not like that. I got laughed. We got laughed at when we asked that question in China. What about the People's Bank? What about the Central Bank? Right? All these, we had a lot of these like libertarian types that are all about the, just the central banks controlling everything. So we got laughed at when we asked that question because it they're like the government. That's the government bank. That's that that bank is ours. It invests in in things that we need. It actually plays a huge role in economic development. We don't want private shareholders in that. And that has played a huge role in being able to facilitate investment in public infrastructure like high-speed rail. And now we're seeing it across the African continent and with the Belt and Road Initiative. These are all, this is a very important to Remember and to remember that all the debt arrangements, the military and the military interventions, the coups that the U.S. and the West continue to promote are really the central problem that faces Africa right now, right? Because China is trying to face poverty head on, climate change head on. It's trying to face all these critical issues, and the China-African relationship is a model of development, of cooperation, which stands in stark contrast to imperialism. And that's why it's such a problem. It's not a problem for human rights. The United States doesn't care about human rights. The West doesn't care about human rights. So, you know, you can watch this by video too here. So of course, you know, go to chronicles of Haifang .substack.com. Subscribe if you can for paid amount, if you're able to. Um, subscribe to my Patreon if you can to support my journalism. Uh, but that will do it for the portion of this where I talk about Trevor Noah, Tucker Carlson. These are really just examples of the corporate media doing what the corporate media does, right? Which is act as a stenographer, act as a microphone, act as a bullhorn for the military industrial complex and for militarism, for imperialism. That's what we see with Trevor Noah. That's what we see with Tucker Carlson. That's, you know, the, Trevor Noah is a so-called liberal, right? Democrat. He supposedly stands to the left of people like Tucker Carlson. But yet, when you look at them objectively, you see that while Tucker Carlson's choice of guests and his egregious nodding, right? His completely despicable nodding to a literal maniac talking about standing atop Chinese skulls is certainly in terms of optics and in terms of rhetorical impact and even emotional impact in its obvious sort of character of white supremacy. The agenda is the same, right? Demonizing and slandering the China-Africa relationship as an African person yourself, saying that colonialism is ended, not talking about the West and the US and how they super exploit the continent is literally just playing into the hands of the very forces that emboldened Tucker Carlson that emboldened this uh, Jesse Kelly figure. This is a dialectic that is playing out before our eyes. The agenda is right. The interests that imperialism has are focused heavily on containing, undermining, and ultimately overthrowing the people's Republic of China. That's what all the Taiwan business is about. That's what the China Africa stuff is about. That's what the Asia Pacific militarization is about. The sanctions, we can go on and on and on and on and on. That's what this is all about. And we need to pay attention to this because it is a new Cold War. And Cold Wars do not just denote big powers facing off each other. No, it is about the social systems. It is about China's social systems, whatever you think about it, whatever you think about China's socialism with Chinese characteristics. It is that model which is growing in influence, prestige, which is getting stuff done for the people 
of China for the world, which is building massive trillion dollars worth of infrastructure, which is lifting people out of extreme poverty, which is providing the material basis literally for socialism around the world because you can't have socialism with poverty. The Sino Lao Railway, which just jumped off in Lao, connecting Kunming uh, to, to Lao. Like we're talking about major developments that threaten the United States' hegemony. And that's what this is about. This is about capitalism, imperialism at its dead end, at its decline, seeing China as the most significant threat to its continued rule, Russia being second to that and uh, being within the same purview, given how, and I wrote about this, this in CGTN, which I'll be publishing on Substack and Patreon, how that relationship is really the model for what global governance should look like, what global cooperation, solidarity should look like in the 21st century, the China-Russia relationship, and how much that threatens the United States as well. So in any event, I got to go. I'm going to Luna Oi's channel. And it was really good to be with all of you. Thanks so much for coming out for this impromptu stream uh, again. This is the holidays. I get it. Hard times. It's hard times for me mentally, financially, all of that. Um, you know, we're, we're really struggling out here in the belly of the beast. The economic crisis is raging. Uh, I forgot to say rest in power, Russell Maroon Schultz. In graduate school, I actually used his daughter's speech about him in my uh, seminar paper on solitary confinement. And I eventually published that actually in an academic journal under my government name. Maybe I'll share that with you all one day. Um, but uh, I really, you know, he was an inspiration as a Black Liberation Army uh, hero, someone who was in solitary for more than 40 years a revolutionary, a black revolutionary, uh, you know, with Glenn Ford, it's death, very hard on me, very hard on this movement. We've lost so many elders, so many political prisoners that need to be free. We got to free Julian Assange, but we also have to free all political prisoners, especially those who gave their lives to the black liberation movement and the black freedom movement, the indigenous people's movement. Uh, Leonard Peltier, for example, we have to, we have to say their names, you know, and we just don't do it often enough in independent left media. Nobody really does. It's, you know, Black Agenda Report is one of the few that do. So, you know, we got to do that. And, and so the holidays are really hard time for me because it, it's kind of like a reminder, right? Especially during this COVID period about how things are really, it's, it's getting dire, it's getting intense. And, and you can feel just the rot, the stagnation. You can feel the Bernie movement. They don't know where they're at. Like none of these Bernie progressives know where they're at, whether they rejected Bernie, whether they don't reject Bernie Sanders. They don't know. Like, they don't know where to go. I'm a communist. I know where I need to go. I need to be with the workers movement. I need to be with the proletarian movement. I need to be with the internationalist movement. I need to be fighting imperialism. I need to, I need to get where I fit in, you know, get in where I fit in. I need to be with the people and I need to struggle no matter how hard it is. I need to speak out and I need to be connected. I need to reject this electoralism, social demo democracy, all of that. I need to reject all of that. And I need to be a voice of reason and a voice against imperialism. And, and I focus a lot on China because somebody has to do it. And I want to be part of that. And I have a very personal pol and political interest in doing so, given my own history, uh, given my, the fact that I've traveled to China, given the connections I have in China, the people that I see just you know, being hurt by this and the fact that all U.S. wars, the devastation that have been wrought in part over the last decade or so have been targeted at China in some respects. And people don't make that connection. They'll make it with Russia, right? NATO escalating with Russia, all of that, Syria. But China's a part of this too. And so that's why I'm here, guys. Salute to all of you. I really appreciate you coming out. Uh, you know, I'm going to keep trying to do this. I'll keep trying to come on when things get hot. You know, the 23rd, we might be having a stream with Frank Chapman. So be on the lookout for that with Margaret Kimberly on his book, which is an amazing book, Marxism. And I believe it's called, uh, what is it called? Man, now I feel embarrassed. Uh, I just read this book too. Um, it's a great book. It's called, uh, hold on one second. I got to look this up now. Marxist Leninist Perspectives on Black Liberation and Socialism. Great book. I loved it. It really really, really uh, 
you know, just did a whole lot of good for me uh, to learn about the period, right? This 20th century, the Communist Party USA period, gleaning real lessons from it rather than this nonsense conversation we see on social media about patriotism and about, you know, whether we should be talking about race or not. Like, I'm sick of these conversations, right? Colorblindness, no colorblindness. Should we talk about white supremacy? Should we anger Trump voters? Stop thinking about electoral politics and start thinking about revolutionary politics. That's my advice, right? Because if you're so scared that white supremacy is going to alienate people, you're so scared that making this connection with white supremacy and capitalism and imperialism is going to alienate people, then really you're scared of revolution because if you really do love the workers, you love the working people, then you got to you got to you, you got to confront that, right? If there's resistance to that, you got to confront it. How are you going to get people to do anything? I never understood this. I'm just going to leave it here, guys. Never understood. I've been in a lot of struggles, anti-war struggles. I've been in the labor movement. I've never withheld my politics in every workplace. I'm, mind you, I don't go up to the boss and say, hey, I'm a communist. No, I don't do that. But when it comes to winning over workers and trying to uh, fight battles on the front lines, like I had to do that many times as a shop steward, I didn't say like, hey, I'm not going to talk about white supremacy. No, I even had to talk about many times with black workers who thought they were being discriminated against, who thought they were being targeted. And, you know, I think that they were. Unfortunately, labor law is not so generous. So it's really hard to fight those battles. And so sometimes we had to go a different approach. But I would talk about this and I would be very honest about how I felt. How could you not? Like, how could you? How does it help the working class struggle not? being honest about the reality of the situation, even if people don't see it the same way. Everyone's saying, oh, free speech, we got to protect free speech, but yet you're censoring yourself? Yet you're so worried about what some image of what a white Trump voter looks like who's working class that you're not going to talk about the reality of the situation for, let's say, black people caught up in mass incarceration. You're not going to tell them about that? You're not going to say that those prisoners, 800,000 plus black prisoners, aren't your comrades? that they're not workers, that they don't deserve to be free and to not have their lives ruined and destroyed because of mass incarceration. You're not going to talk about that. You're not going to talk about how those white workers are probably making, you know, 40 to 50 cents more per hour than their black workers. Like that's not going to help anybody. So anyway, that's why I do what I do. That's why I talk about white supremacy. So I talk about capitalism. That's why I talk about imperialism. That's why I talk about China. And so I really appreciate all of you. Red salute to all of you.